we continue the varieties of religious experience, a study in human nature by William James. We are continuing it by starting on lectures 16 and 17, mysticism. Over and over again in these lectures, I have raised points and left them open and unfinished until we should have come to the subject of mysticism. Some of you, I fear, may have smiled as you noticed my reiterated postponements. But now the hour has come when mysticism must be faced in good earnest, and those broken threads wound up together, one may say truly, I think, that personal religious experience has its roots and center in mystical states of consciousness. So for us, who in these lectures are treating personal experience as the exclusive subject of our study, such states of consciousness ought to form the vital chapter from which the other chapters get their light. Whether my treatment of mystical states will shed more light or darkness, I do not know, for my own constitution shuts me out from their enjoyment almost entirely, and I can speak of them only at second hand. But, though forced to look upon the subject so externally, I will be as the objective and I will be as objective and receptive as I can, and I think I shall at least succeed in convincing you of the reality of the states in question and of the paramount importance of their function. First of all, then I ask, what does the expression mystical states of consciousness mean? How do we part off mystical states from other states? The word mysticism and mystical are often used as terms of mere reproach to throw at any opinion which we regard as vague and vast and sentimental and without a base in either facts or logic. For some writers, a mystic is any person who believes in thought transference or spirit return. Employed in this way, the word has little value. There are too many less ambiguous synonyms. So, to keep it useful by restricting it, I will do what I did in the case of the word religion and simply propose to you four marks which, when an experience has them, may justify us in calling it mystical for the purpose of the present lectures. In this way, we shall save verbal disputation and the recriminations that generally go therewith. 1. Ineffability. The handiest of the marks by which I classify a state of mind as mystical is negative. The subject of it immediately says that it defi uh, defies expression that no adequate report of its contents can be given in words. It follows from this that its quality must be directed, may, must be directly experienced. It cannot be imparted or transferred to others. In this peculiarity, mystical states are more like states of feeling than like states of intellect. No one can make clear to another who has never had a certain feeling in what the quality or worth of it consists one must have musical ears to know the value of a symphony. One must have been in love oneself to understand a lover's state of mind. Lacking the heart or ear, we cannot interpret the musician or the lover justly, and are even likely to consider him weak-minded or absurd. The mystic finds that most of us accord to his experiences an equally an incompetent treatment. Two. Noetic quality. Although so similar to states of feeling, mystical states seem to those who experience them to be also states of knowledge. They are states of insight in the depths of truth, unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate, though they remain, and as a rule they carry with them a curious sense of authority for after time. These two characters will entitle any state to be called mystical in the sense in which I use the word. Two other qualities are less sharply marked, but are usually found. These are transiency, mystical states, 
cannot be sustained for long, except in rare instances, half an hour, or at most an hour or two, seem to be the limit beyond which they fade into the light of common day. Well, unless they're drug-induced, there are some drugs that last longer than that, but all those things that people turn to drugs for that are beneficial, uh, sensual, emotional, psychiatric states, um, they're available without all that, right? Often when faded, their quality can but imperfectly be reproduced in memory, but when they recur, it is recognized, and from one reoccurrence to another, it is susceptible of continuous development in what is felt as inner richness and importance. Or passivity. Although the oncoming of mystical states may be facilitated by preliminary voluntary operations, as by fixing the attention, or going through certain bodily performances, or in other ways which manuals of mysticism prescribe, yet when the characteristic sort of consciousness once has set in, the mystic feels as if his own will were in abeyance, and indeed sometimes as if he were grasped and held by a superior power, this latter peculiarity connects mystical states with certain definite phenomena of secondary or alternative personality, such as prophetic speech, automatic writing, or the mediumistic trance. When these latter conditions are well pronounced, however, there may be no recollection whatever of the phenomenon, and it may have no significance for the subject's usual inner life, to which, as it were, it makes a mere interpretation. Mystical states, strictly so called, are never merely interpretive. Some memory of their content always remains, and a profound sense of their importance may modify the inner life of the subject between the times of their recurrence. Sharp divisions in this region are, however, difficult to make, and we find all sorts of gradations and mixtures. These four characteristics are sufficient to mark out a group of states of consciousness peculiar enough to deserve a special name and to call for careful study. Let it then be called the mystical group. Our next step should be to gain acquaintance with some typical examples. Professional mystics at the height of their development have often elaborately organized experiences and a philosophy based thereupon. But you remember what I said in my first lecture. Phenomena are best understood when placed within their series, studied in their germ and in their overripe decay, and compared with their exaggerated and degenerated kindred. The range of mystical experience is very wide, much too wide for us to cover in the time at our disposal. Yet the method of serial study is so essential for interpretation that if we really wish to reach conclusions, we must use it. I will begin, therefore, with phenomena which claim no special religious significance and end with those of which the religious pretensions are extreme. The simplest rudiment of mystical experience would seem to be that deepened sense of the significance of a maxim or formula which occasionally sweeps over one. I've heard that said all my life, we exclaim, but I never realized its full meaning until now. When a fellow monk, said Luther, one day repeated the words of the creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, I saw the scripture in an entirely new light, and straight away I felt as if I was born anew. It was as if I had found the door of paradise thrown wide open. Newman's Securus Judicat Orbis Terrarum is another instance. This sense of the deeper significance is not confined to rational propositions. Single words and conjunctions of words, effects of light on land and sea, odors and musical sounds all bring it when the mind is tuned aright. Mesopotamia is the stock comic instance, just like Walla Walla, Washington, right? An excellent old German lady who had done some traveling in her day used to describe to me her se her sehen sucked that she might yet visit Philadelphia, whose wondrous name had always haunted her imagination. Of John Foster, it is said that single words as Chalcedony, or names of ancient heroes, had a mighty fascination over him. At any time, the word hermit was enough to transport him. The words woods 
and fourths would produce the most powerful emotion. Foster's Life by Ryland, New York, 1846, page 3. Most of us can remember the strangely moving power of passages in certain poems read when we were young, irrational doorways as they were, through which the mystery of fact, the wildness, and the pain of life stole into hearts and thrilled them. The words have now perhaps become mere polished surfaces for us, but lyric poetry and music are alive and significant only in proportion as they fetch these vague vistas of a life continuous with our own, beckoning and inviting yet ever eluding our pursuit. We are alive or dead to the eternal inner message of the arts, according as we have kept or lost this mystical susceptibility. A more profound step forward on the mystical ladder is found in an extremely frequent phenomenon, that sudden feeling, namely, which sometimes sweeps over us, of having been here before, as if some indefinite past time, in just this place, with just these people. We were already saying just these things, as Tennyson writes, I've is there any Tennyson that I haven't shared? Um, I'll double check at some point, right? Well, over something is our scenes that touches me with mystic gleams, like glimpses of forgotten dreams of something felt like something here, of something done I know not where, such as no language may declare. Now, I've, conclu uh, I've concluded that, uh, I mean, I included that on the uh, Celt thing because... The guy kind of fits into the mold of a Celtic bard. Um, and that's from the two voices in the letter to Mr. B.P. Blood. Tennyson reports of himself as follows. I have never had any revelations through an aesthetics, but a kind of walking trance. This, for lack of a better word, I have frequently had quite up from boyhood, when I have been all alone, this has come upon me through repeating my own name to myself silently, till all at once, as it were, out of the intensity of the consciousness of individuality, individuality itself seemed to dissolve and fade away into boundless being, and this, not a confused state, but the clearest, the surest of the surest, utterly beyond words, where death was, an almost laughable impossibility. The loss of personality is, so it were, seeming no extinction, but the only true life. I am ashamed of my feeble description. Have I not said the state is utterly beyond words? Professor Tyndall, in a letter, recalls Tennyson saying of this condition, By God Almighty, there is no delusion in the matter. It is no nebulous ecstasy, but a state of transcendent wonder associated with absolute clearness of mind. Memoirs of Tennyson, 2, 473. Sir James Crichton Brown has given the technical name of dreamy states to these sudden invasions of vaguely reminiscent consciousness. The Lancet, July 6 and 13, 1895, reprinted as the Cavendish Lecture on Dreamy Mental States, London, Bellier, 1895. They have been a good deal discussed of late by psychologists. See, for example, Bernard Leroy, The Illusion de Faust, Reconnaissance, uh, Reconnaissance, is but I don't know how you say the French one, but uh, published in Paris, 1895. Okay. They bring a sense of mystery and of the metaphysical duality of things and the feeling of an enlargement of perception which seems imminent, but which never completes itself. In Dr. Crichton Brown's opinion, they connect themselves with the perplexed and scared disturbances of self-consciousness, which occasionally precede epileptic attacks. I think that this learned alienist not what we mean by that now, um, takes a rather absurdly alarmist view of an intrinsically insignificant phenomenon. He follows it along the downward ladder to insanity. Our path pursues the upward ladder chiefly. The divergence shows how important it is to neglect no part of a phenomenon's connections, 
for we make it appear admirable or dreadful according to the context by which we set it off. Somewhat deeper plunges into mystical consciousness are met with in yet other dreamy states. Such feelings as these, which Charles Kingsley describes, are surely far from being uncommon, especially in youth. When I walk in the fields, I am oppressed now and then with an innate feeling that everything I see has a meaning, if I could but understand it. And this feeling of being surrounded with truths which I cannot grasp amounts to indescribable awe sometimes. Have you not felt that your real soul was imperceptible to your mental vision except in a few hollowed moments? Charles Kingsley's Life, 155, quoted by Ing. Christian Mysticism, London, 1899, page 341. A much more extreme state of mystical consciousness is described by J.A. Simmons, and probably more persons than we suspect could give parallels to it from their own experience. Suddenly, writes Simmons, at church or in company, or when I was reading, and always, I think, when my muscles were at rest, I felt the approach of the mood. Irresistibly, it took possession of my mind and will, lasted but seemed an eternity, and disappeared in a series of rapid sensations which resembled the awakening from an aesthetic influence. One reason why I disliked this kind of trance was that I could not describe it to myself. I cannot even now find words to render it intelligible. Yeah, I've had a bunch of experiences like that. Um, I, I convey them as best as I can, but um, you notice some of the language kind of um, indicates that it's not something that I can imagine. I can only just um, imagine a reference to it, right? It consists in a gradual but swiftly progressive obliteration of space-time sensation and the multitudinous factors of experience which seem to qualify what we are pleased to call ourselves. In proportion, as these conditions of ordinary consciousness were subtracted, the sense of an underlying or essential consciousness acquired intensity. At last, nothing remained but a pure, absolute, abstract self. The universe became without form and void of con content, but self persisted, formidable in its vivid keenness. Feeling the most poignant doubt about reality, ready as it seemed to find existence break as breaks a bubble round about it, and what then? The apprehension of a coming dissolution? The grim conviction that this state was the last state of consciousness, self, that sense that I had followed the last thread of being to the verge of the abyss and had arrived at demonstration of eternal maya, or illusion, stirred or seemed to stir me up again. The return of ordinary conditions of sentient existence began by my first recovering the power of touch, and then by the gradual, though rapid influx of familiar impressions and diurnal interests. At last I felt myself once more a human being, and though the riddle of what is meant by life remained unsolved, I was thankful for this return from the abyss, this deliverance from so awful an initiation into the mysteries of skepticism. This trance, reoccur uh, this trance recurred with diminishing frequency until I reached the age of twenty-eight. It served to impress upon my growing nature the phantasmal unreality of all the circumstances which I contribute to a merely phenomenal consciousness. Often I have asked myself with anguish on waking from that formless state of denuded, keenly sentient being, which is the unreality, the trance of fiery, vacant, apprehensive, skeptical self from which I issue. Are these surrounding phenomena and habits which veil that inner self and build a self of flesh and blood conventionally? Again, are men the factors of some dream, the dreamlike unsubstantiality, of which they comprehend at such eventful moments? What would happen if the final stage of the trance were reached? H. F. Brown, J. A. Simmons, A Biography, London, 1895, page 29 to 31, abridged. In a recital like this, there is certainly something suggestive of pathology. The next step into mystical states carries us into a realm that public opinion and ethical philosophy have long since branded as pathological, though private practice and certain ly lyrical strains of poetry seem to bear witness to its ideality. I refer to the consciousness produced by the intoxicants and, and aesthetics, especially by alcohol, 
The sway of alcohol over mankind is unquestionably due to its power to stimulate the mystical faculties of human nature usually crushed to earth by the cold facts and dry criticisms of the sober hour. Sobriety diminishes, discriminates, and says no. Drunkenness expands, unites, and says yes. It is, in fact, the greatest, the great exciter of the yes function in man. Well, breaks down control that may stop in the way of yes, right? Um, it is, in fact, the great exciter of the yes function in man. It brings its votary from the chill periphery of things to the radiant core. It makes him, for the moment, one with truth. Not through mere perversity do men run after it. Two, the poor and unlettered it stands in the place of symphony concerts and of literature, and it is part of the deeper mystery and tragedy of life that whiffs and gleams of something that we immediately recognize as excellent should be vouchsafed to so many of us only in the fleeting earlier phases of what in its totality is so degrading a poisoning. Well, a lot of medicines are like that, too, is that certain uh, benefits, you could say, go away, um, or at least the um, ill effects rise to the point of it not being worth it. Um, the drunken consciousness is one bit of the mystic consciousness, and our total opinion of it must find its place in our opinion of that larger whole.